How's it going, Future Cannabis Project community? Lobster Fam Farms here. Today I'd like to go through some of my most recent techniques and methods to be viroid safe while taking cuttings. So I like to start by bleaching any and all tools I will be using to take cuttings. That includes the scissors, the bottom trays, the top domes, and even the little plastic containers that I'm going to be using to put the cubes in and the rooting solution. And anything you use, you want to bleach thoroughly. I've had these scissors soaking in the bleach for about 20 minutes. equipment and tools bleached. I've taken a shower and changed my clothes so I can be as clean as I can. Now it's time to set up for taking cuttings. So I've got some rock wool cubes today. I'm going to be handling everything with plants or with plant fluid with my left hand which is going to be gloved at all times with a different glove for each plant. So I've got my preferred Rooting mixture water ready. I'm going to start soaking some cubes. While those are soaking, I'm going to place in each plastic cup. This isn't something I've ever done before taking cuttings, but Thinking about it long and hard, it seems like this is another way that the fluids can pass through each other. So if you're not doing one genetic from one plant on a whole tray, this is my preferred technique. Where I bleach these little cups, I'll do probably maybe nine per tray, maybe only six or eight. But what I'm trying to accomplish here is making it so that the root base and the fluids passing through will never touch each other. And I'm gonna to try to give them each enough space so that the plants themselves don't touch each other if they were from a different mother plant. Cubes are soaked up. With the glove hands, I'm gonna plop one in each. And then after we get those all set up, next step begins. So I'm making my labels for the plants that I'm gonna be taking cuttings from. And even this process, I'm gonna hold them all with my left hand with a fresh glove and use the marker with the right hand. Just because these are gonna be jammed down in the soil. I do not know how long the fluid would just live on a piece of plastic and fresh air, but one more thing to keep in mind. So I've got my area staged. I've got all my scissors bleached and cleaned. I have as many gloves as I can fit on my paw comfortably. I can usually fit about nine or 10 before I start losing dexterity and circulation. I have about 18 different plants to take cuttings from today. So two rounds of nine gloves will do just fine. Last thing I'm doing is putting rooting solution in each of their own individual cups for the 18 plants. I like to use plastic Dixies and bleach them but sometimes these little wax paper ones are good in a pinch. They're quick, they're cheap, and it doesn't really like leave too much of a carbon footprint. So, got my rooting solution ready, one for each plant. So what I'm running through today, I have eight Harlem River hazes from Piff Coast Genetics. And uh, I generally like the morphology so far. They got humongous leaves. Some of them are narrow, some of them are a little broader, but I like the way they're drawn. Next, I have some Sister Nice. That is a Oregon Afghani crossed with a G13, old school G13. These ones are from Professor P and Relic Seeds. And I'm really digging these ones. They got the super leathery looking leaves, dark, dark green. Now this one right here has a serious issue that doesn't seem to be showing itself anywhere else in the garden. So it's gotta be a mutation or something genetic. 
Anyone out in the community who can give me a little clarity on this, it seems like it's directly one half of this leaf, directly these two halves of these leaf blades. I don't want to go bro science and try to diagnose it. If anyone out there knows better than me, let me know. I have four of those. Then I have these two that I'm very excited about. These are a Oregon Afghani crossed with uh, the cheese mail, the cheese back cross mail that Professor P messes with. These ones again have super, super dark green, leathery leaves, squat growth. And I'm really, really stoked to see what comes out of these. I only have a couple, so it's kind of a gamble, but we'll see, it's always fun. Speaking of gambles, I have three of the Holy Communion crossed to a Wilson by a mortal hashery, who I don't think he would call himself a breeder, but he made some seeds. They found their way into my hand and they got wet the next day. So I have four of them. This one, I don't think I'm gonna take a cutting off of. I just don't like the growth of it. Just, I just don't dig it. So I got these three that I'm gonna take cuttings off of. This one's super, super lanky. This one's got some broader, darker leaves. A little more closer structure, but the branches aren't going out so much. This one I kind of like so far. I'm hoping this one's a tasty female. That's what's on the table today. So I think I'm just gonna do six plants per tray on this one. I have, this hand is gonna be my scissor hand every time that's not gonna to touch a plant. And it's gonna go from, this scissor's gonna be put down, I'm gonna grab a fresh one every time. I'm gonna to try to not get plant fluid on this hand regardless, even though ideally it's not touching another plant. Each time I go through a plant, I rip off a pair of gloves, and then that is for the next plant. I have a little cup of rooting solution that will be just for this plant, ready to rock and roll. Now, as I've already gone over in a previous short I did, I like to get at least two cuttings when I'm first starting so that I can flower one and keep one as a backup. So I'm going to try to get at least two off of each plant. This first one is the Holy Communion crossed into the Wilson. And I'll tell you what, that sucker looks covered in grease already. Woo, doggy! Okay, that's fun, that's fun. And now this plant is gonna rest on the cup that it's going into. Damn, this plant smells good, man. I love this stuff. So we have two of the Holy Communion Wilson number ones ready to go. This set of scissors going down. After I plug those, this pair of gloves coming off. Actually, these scissors aren't going down yet. This is something I wanted to touch on. Now, I've been being hyper cautious with this round of seedlings. I haven't even pruned the cotyledons or like the little jammies off yet. So since I have a pair of gloves and scissors that correlate with this plant, this is a perfect time to get in there and prune. And typically I would have already pruned all this stuff off, but again, just trying to be hyper cautious this round against this viroid, but this is a plant shape that I much prefer, especially when doing a hunt, because that doesn't take up as much room. It's not gonna transpire as much, maintain it pretty much just get cuts off of it. And another thing to consider that I just thought of, since I'm doing so many less plants than typical in a tray like this, the little microclimate in there is gonna be something to consider. Now, I'm gonna take some bigger cuts to try to fill that area out, but whatever your technique is gonna be, if it gets too dry in there, obviously the cuttings aren't gonna be happy, so if you're ever gonna do this few cuts per tray, most people do 50, 20 at least, you're gonna to have to keep that in consideration. The microclimate's gonna be a little different. So these have soaked for a solid 10 seconds or so. I'm gonna use the same glove. Just 
Take that sucker right in. Use this same glove. I don't see how this can be a male. This thing reeks. And so now those two plants are gonna take up that little area. These ones are gonna get their own area. Even though they're sisters, and pro they came from the same, you know, flower, just in case they're all gonna get their own space. I haven't heard conclusively from anyone yet if there is a 10% pass of the viroid through seeds. Doesn't seem like it's really proven yet, so I'm gonna assume yes, and that if I have 18 cuttings in here, most likely two of them are coming equipped with the viroid. So why not just keep them all separate and keep them safe? And from there, it's a good way to start things at least. So this plant's pruned, this glove off, on to the next one, wash, rinse, repeat. Some final thoughts on hop latent prevention when taking cuttings. So it's not just when taking cuttings, it's all throughout the entire gardening process. Even late stage transmission can lead to some funky flowers. So I've been trying to train myself to be super diligent. One thing I like about the garden beds is that if you do the same genetic, ideally from the same mother plant, let's assume the plants are clean to start, then you can only have to use one set of scissors per day on, you know, or one, one pair of scissors per bed, which is ideal to me that like, I'm like not stripping gloves off all the time and just being able to go at it and not have to worry about all the little hiccups in between. That really helps me a lot. Um, some questions I have for the community. If anyone else knows, like I'd love to know some things. How long is this? How long can the viroid survive on fingertips? Like, let's assume I had dirty practices, pinching some leaves off of some infected plants. How long can it live in that fluid on my fingertips? How long can it live on the plant fluid on the scissors? Let's say I missed something and shared scissors with a plant that I shouldn't have but it was like, you know, let's say in theory, 10 days apart, can that fluid still be living on those scissors? What's the expiration date? And how that can correlate too, it's like, let's say I, I pruned an infected plant two days ago. I got plant fluid on my hand. That was the last thing I did. Now I'm going to a clean garden, is like my watering practices and me touching the bucket and like my hand even touching the water that's the mixture. Is that a possible transmission? I don't think so, but like, I want these things to be clearly laid out, that's for sure. One thing I would love to is to see clear, concise, conclusive evidence if the viroid is being passed by pests or not. I feel like then all of these techniques are for naught, if it's just gonna be as simple as uh, having a bug come in, bite one plant and bite another. I've heard very conflicting views on this subject. I'd love to raise the conversation more. I'm not educated enough in you know, entomology or plant biology to speculate, but I'm assuming it can, you know, but I wanna know how long can that plant fluid survive on a, a pest, you know, anthers or, you know, wherever this fluid is smothered in its face. So I'd love to keep this conversation going. I'd love to hear other people's approaches and techniques. If anyone sees any folly in my approach, I'd love to hear that as well. And uh, nothing but respect and most love to the cannabis community. Peace out.